everyone. Welcome back to Fitness Philadelphia. I'm Dr. John Herding, and today we have a very special guest, someone that I'm super excited to have on the podcast, Mr. CJ Appenzeller. How are you, CJ? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Absolutely. CJ is the owner of ATS Strength in West Berlin, New Jersey, South Jersey. And he is one of the guys I respect the most as far as how it comes to strength and conditioning, how I've watched his business grow over the last 10 years. He's always been, you know, we have recently, we haven't connected often, but he's, he's been a mentor for me as far as some of the strength and conditioning stuff goes. And his Rolodex is filled with some of the best of the best. And I think he's really done it right in and growing his gym to this point. And we were just talking before the podcast, he's starting to see the fruits of his labor. And I'm really excited to see, see where the next 10 years goes for him. So I appreciate you, CJ. And again, thank you for coming on. Absolutely, man. In the next 10 years, I feel like I'm going to be retired. <laughs> I, you know what? I mean, if we could all get to that point, that would be great. Yeah, uh, but so we we are just talking about like the the wealth of the way the direction your business is going, some of the online stuff you're doing. You're taking trips to you know Dubai with some of your athletes. You're watching guys in the M MLB training combine this weekend. Yep. Um, can you kind of give us your origin story and how you got to this point where you were just describing you're you're at this place where you're kind of training the best of the best and the consultant to you know the the top level athletes around the world. So can you kind of give us your origin story and how you came to be where you are, why you started the gym, et cetera? Absolutely. So it's always funny. I'm a professor now too. So now like I always tell my students, I'm like, I'm getting really old. I'm not looking so old, but I feel, I feel very old. And uh, this is always the story I tell my students. I always say, do not start your business like this, but this is how I started. So I'll tell you the truth. I started my business on a B and A, right? Little breaking and entering. So <laughs> I uh, come home from my freshman year of college and I had been training in the weight room. I'd been doing some different things. I put on 15 pounds and some of my old teammates were like, hey, we want you to train us, show us what you're doing. I said, no problem. So two of them particularly said, hey, meet us at this batting cage at around noon. I'm pretty sure it was noon, don't quote me. I might've said one at another story, but now 11 years ago, 12 years ago. So I say, okay, yeah, no problem. I said, are we good to get in there? They're like, oh yeah, no problem, no problem. So we go to this indoor batting cage and uh, we get there and I said, hey, who's got the key? They said, oh. We don't have a key, but we know a way in. And I'm like, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> so we sneak through this kind of back garage door, right? It had like the, the middle panel was busted out of the garage. And uh, we sneak through it. I'm like, you guys sure we're good? They're like, yeah, it's the middle of the day. Like nobody comes in here until 4 or 5 p.m. I'm like, okay, no problem. This place had a couple little weights, a couple of kettlebells. I'll never forget. They had this like red coated kettlebell, like the rubber one you buy at Walmart. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah. that specifically because that's what we were doing. So we're doing some kettlebell swings and I'm coaching these two guys through kettlebell swings, right? And a light turns on in the back of the house, essentially, where the office is. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. But in my head, I'm like, maybe it's the landlord. Maybe it's somebody who doesn't know we're not supposed to be here. So I said, guys, just keep training. The guy comes out. He's like, what are you guys doing here? I'm like, oh, sir, you're gonna have to wait a second. I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of a session. We never interrupt sessions. He's like, bullshit. Can I curse on here? He's like, bullshit. He's yeah. like, he's like, middle of a session. He's like, this is my place. He's like. You're not doing a session here. So this is the owner of the place. So I just stick to my guns. I'm like, listen, sir, you're going to have to wait a second. I said, right after I'm done with these guys, we can talk. So he sits there kind of steaming, hands on hips. These guys get done their kettlebell swings. I go over. I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, you know, and at this point, I had no idea what I was doing in terms of training, you know, fast mm. forward versus now. But I looked at him. I said, hey, I'm a strength and conditioning coach for athletes. And he said, oh, yeah? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, come on in Tuesday. Mm -hmm. for an interview so this guy had the opportunity yeah shout out jim he had the opportunity to probably call the cops probably have me arrested and instead of that he interviewed me to train what he was running at the time was travel ball baseball teams mm -hmm. so i go in there that following tuesday he tells me to be there at seven i get there at 6 40 maybe 6 30 i mm -hmm. walk in shirt and tie ready for an interview he goes you're late i'm like what do you mean i'm like i'm at least 20 minutes early he's like no they're waiting for you on the floor i go out on the floor a full team, 18, 13 year old kids are out there just staring at me. He's like, take them through some training. I'm like, all right, let's rock and roll. I loosened up the tie, trained the team, yeah. made it happen. He hired me at that point to come in and train some of his baseball teams. I actually wound up subleasing his space from him. And that was my first location. I sublet 550 square foot. Mm -hmm. And we grew that in like 13 or so months to 65 members. And then it was time to kind of move on and to greener pastures and things like that. But that's how it all started on a break and an entering. Don't do that. 
but that's that's how we got it rolling. That's amazing though, and that speaks to your your kind of personality, right? You've I, you've created your own opportunities throughout this process, and you could have very easily said, "Hey guys, we got to go. We can't get caught," and just <laughs> ran out. And you kind of yep. took that head on. I mean, he could have handled it differently, but so kudos to him for handling it the way he did, right? Yeah, but and we're it, still great friends right to this day. Yeah, and that and that's a great story. Yeah, yeah, it's always funny. I'll see him at some baseball games and stuff. He's he's retired now. He lives down the shore. So whenever yeah. we go down for coaches versus cancer is always held at I'm pretty sure at Mainland High School. So we always go down and watch prep play, and he's always there. And I always tell the story. I bring interns every year. I'm like, let me tell. Look, this is the guy that started the gym. Yeah, <laughs> and here he is, man. It's it's cool. It's it's interesting how things grow and develop and. You know, sometimes you just got to take a risk if you really want to be great in whatever it is, whatever the pursuit is, right? Whether yeah. it's athletics, whether it's business, like you got to take a risk to be great. You got to be willing to to take the step up, to take the next level, maybe even when you're not quite ready or you don't feel that you're quite ready because those opportunities, you know, can pass you by quickly. So that's kind of how I feel about it. And that's what I always tell the students at Rowan. I say, listen, no b and Don't come back and say, I told you to break into anything. Okay. But, yep, that's it. Yeah, but I, I think it speaks to, obviously, there's luck and we're both business owners and there's luck in business along the way. But I also think a lot of it is taking that risk and creating your own opportunities. And, and that's what separates small business owners and entrepreneurs apart from your, your typical nine to five employee, right? It's Absolutely. We're willing to take those risks, ride or die by our decisions, you know, and, and so far for both of us has worked out enough. So far, so good, right? Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting you say that because... I, I like that, you know, I'm not a huge, like, internet quote guy, but Gary Vee's, like, in the beginning of a Young Jeezy song, as a matter of fact. He's like, you know, I hope, I secretly hope my businesses go to nothing, everyone talks shit on me on the internet, and then I can rise like the phoenix from the ashes, which is, you know, this is the Philly Fitness Podcast. Everyone who's listening to this had to do with the C word not too long ago, right? We all had to kind of phoenix and rise from the ashes, and and it was it was a blessing and a curse, right? It made you really reflect and realize what it is that you want from your career, from your business, ultimately what you're trying to accomplish, what your aspirations truly are. And, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't make it through that moment. And I think, again, it speaks to that. Who's ready to step up? Who's ready to take the, the chance, you know, even when you're not ready, even when you haven't prepared? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's interesting, man. That's, that's a quote that sticks out to me. And we actually liked it so much that we painted the giant Phoenix wings on the ATS logo at the gym. And it's, if, if you're not ready for that, then maybe don't own a business. Like you said, just be an employee yeah. and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that uh, like two of the hardest hit industries during COVID were restaurants and gyms, right? Yeah. But the gyms that I've talked to and the gyms that we have relationships with, and I'm sure you've seen it too, the gyms that were able to quickly pivot, take things online, they came out of it with another offering and now they're blowing up yep. because they, they were able to solidify their community they have offerings online. They have, they've, we were talking about prior to coming live is they're able to streamline their process a little bit to make sure they're bringing in the people that can help foster the community. And will and now they're just they're They've come out on the other end of COVID just blowing up and doing really, really well. Yeah. I think, you know, pivot was the word that everybody, we all went to that, right? Got to pivot, got to pivot. So we closed, and then the next day, inside of 24 hours, we had all of our offerings ready online. So we were offering, we did three-day live Zoom classes. We provided customized programming to everyone in our facility mm -hmm. through, a, you know, a few different, essentially, what's up, pup? Sorry, my dog is throwing his head in me. Through a few different online resources, we gave away all of our equipment to our members, you know, hundreds of kettlebells, dumbbells. Our people had everything. Yeah. So much so that I went around to all of our athletes. And at the time we had 110 athletes. I went to around to every single athlete's house, gave them a brand new elite FTS band, gave them a brand new stretching strap. We're big on static stretching. I'm sure mm -hmm. someone somewhere is, is kicking a tire right now. I'm mad at me for saying that. We dropped off all that stuff. I have a vlog over on my YouTube of me just going house to house with a mask and gloves on, dropping everything off. But again, like you have to pivot quickly. Yes. But number two, it comes back to what do you want? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? What do you want to get out of it? And ultimately, you know, what is your superpower, right? So I talked to all of my guys about everyone has a superpower, right? It's mm -hmm. You may not have fully developed it yet. You may not be ready to truly step into it yet, but everyone has it. And at our gym, and my particular superpower is caring for people. So 
you know, if I'm going to care for people to the best of my absolute ability, what does that look like in this time? To me, it looked like dropping off bands, dropping off stretching straps, pivoting immediately, giving people exactly what they needed in that time of need. And some people didn't do that, you know, and here we are. Well, that's the thing. How many people, when you're, you're thinking about how you're going to pay rent next month, are actually going out, purchasing equipment to give to your athletes? Yeah, not many, right. not many. Yeah, the, you should have heard the equipment people. So my stretching straps, we use a particular t type of stretching strap. I was on the phone with them. I'm like, I need 110 more. They're like, yeah. are you guys not closed? I'm like, oh, no, we are. <laughs> you know, yeah. we just got to figure it out. Well, yeah, and even then, you're a lot of times people were paying a premium for that equipment. So you're paying a little bit more. You're spending the gas money and the time to drive around, drop it off of these athletes. It does make for an interesting product when you're actually filming this to get the reactions and creating a blog. <laughs> I think that's that's just a, that's an outside the box thinking, you know, thing that I think you know helps you build content. To now, you have this blowing up online presence on TikTok. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, so that's, that's interesting, man. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. So let's talk about, so to give, tell the people a little bit about how your gym works and now all of these offerings that you have, because you have the online offerings, you have the in-person stuff, yep. you're traveling with some of your athletes, let the people know, like if they want to reach out to you because they, they hear this podcast, they hear that you're doing great things, all the different ways that they can work with you both in person and remotely. And what are some of the offerings that you have? Yeah, so our gym was founded on kind of a small group model, small group personalized training, right? Where everything's customized to the individual, but you train in small groups. And, and our thing has always been, we believe that energy is real, right? And you can't get energy from some zero or some one, right? So even though, you know, John and I might be training next to each other, we might be doing completely different things, customized to our needs, but we can still feed off of that energy. So that's always been our primary offering, still is our primary offering, small group personalized training. We do a ton of athletes. I'm most known for my work in baseball, but I have professional athletes in lacrosse, boxing, football, baseball, basketball. So I have, I have professionals in, in almost every kind of different sport. Now, what we did was we pivoted to the online thing, and I'm still kind of new to online, right? Obviously, when during the C word, we had to go online. So we started investing in these different programs, investing in these different ways, uh, these delivery systems to deliver programming and customize it and all those things. So now I do online remote coaching across the country and actually across the world now because we have some athletes that are international. And that could either be, you know, one on one customized to the individual or just recently, just now, as we're doing this podcast in June, you know, 16 days ago, I released my first kind of you know, what we would call a canned program where you could go on, you could buy the program and you could follow it. That's actually called the Slasher 60 program. It's geared towards speed training for the 60 yard dash for baseball athletes, which for some reason we still do that test. Yeah, well, I still can't figure it out, but that's okay. We'll get guys really good at it if that's what's gonna open the door for them. So that's what I do. So we have a ton of different offerings, right? Adult small group, we have our athlete stuff customized to them. We have one-on-one -on -one that some people do use. We have one-on-one -on -one remote, and then we have kind of canned remote programming and that opportunity there too. And our second canned remote program is going to drop this week. Nice. And then what's your process in releasing them? Are you going to plan to release them every couple of weeks, once a month, or are you just kind of going with it as you find time to do that stuff because you're super busy? So it really comes down, relax, bro. So it really comes down to ultimately when the program is completely finished and when I can get good demonstrations and explanations done. So it's it's a time thing for me, right? I don't want to ever release something that's half-baked, you know? Yeah. So this program that I'm going to release this week, we actually changed the name this week. So you'll actually like the name. It's called the Fuzz Factory. So Fuzz Factory is a strength training program for pitchers, high school pitchers. But, you know, it, I've been working on it for over a year. Like the, the, the bones of it have been done for over a year, but it's, you know, can I get good demonstrations? Can I get good explanations done, written out, filmed, upload it into the program and all those different things? Because we know that some of the value in coaching isn't just sets and reps. And we were talking about this before we came on, but the value is in the micro adjustments. It's in how you perform the activities. It's in what you get out of the activities based on that performance. So, you know, to deliver something that's canned isn't my optimal strategy, but I understand that people can't reach me, can't get in touch with me, maybe can't afford the service, maybe can't invest that, that level or that amount. So I have to get them something, but it's still for me, can't be half-baked. If it has my name on it, it has my logo on it, 
It has to be something that's going to get them the, the derived benefit that they want, number one, and number two, that they can adjust and move and ultimately make their, their own. So that's, I, I don't really have, you know, hard plans. And I was just on another podcast last week. They were like, you know, where's the business going? And I'm like, for me, I, I keep telling my staff and I keep telling anyone who will ask, I have what's called AO now. That's what I call it, AO. I have aspirations and then I want to have options, right? Yeah. So I have some things that I want to accomplish both on the coaching side and the business side, but I also want to maintain the ability to have options, to sidestep, to, to change direction, to slip and pivot in, in ways that I want to, in ways that inspire me and not be locked into one model, locked into one thing, locked into go get more members, go sell more programs. I want to have different options to do different things, which is what took me on to TikTok in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. You see... You know, oh, TikTok's blowing up. It has the best na native content, best best reach, right? Organic reach. There we go. That's the term. Yep. So I'm like, okay, let's start trying it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, humble brag, I'm good on camera. I could sit and rip TikToks all day. So we tried it. We did it. And now I'm just shy of 30,000 followers as we record this. By the time this releases, I imagine we'll be over 50,000 followers on there. And, again, it just it's, – it's a testament to what I'm trying to accomplish – aspirations and options, right? I want to be able to slip pivot whenever I want and to create that type of environment. That's what you have to have. Yeah. And, and to me from the outside, it seems like you've created your ideal setting, something that keeps your energy high. And when you're talking about those aspirations and options, if you're not focused, you've never been a, a money guy to me. You've never been a guy that's been focused on the money and I need to make the money work. Like for instance, when you had to pivot, you went out and spent money and cared about other people first, right? And I think like, to me, you've always been this guy, money will come if I treat people right and I make sure I provide an optimal service. And that's why I'm so excited for you to see everything kind of starting to come together. But you've created this environment that's high energy, nurturing for your coaches and your athletes. You're always going to games. You're talking about going to a game later this afternoon. Yep. That's going to like when you're creating an environment like that, that's going to keep you invested, your energy high, that, so you can continue to pro provide an optimal service. So you're always feeling motivated. And and the fact that you're you're taking a year to work on a, an online program because you have a pride in the service that you're offering. And again, it's not money driven. Let me just get something out there because I know with my 30,000 followers, I'll make a couple hundred bucks. Yep. Right. So that's what really impresses me. And I, with how you, like just you as a person and how you've crafted your business, it's it's high energy, not putting money first, caring about people. And if the money comes, it comes. But either way, you're happy. You have a great environment. And I think that speaks to, again, I, I, you know, I've said it a million times, just to where you're, you are and you're creating options for yourself in the future based on this great foundation you've created for yourself. It's great. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it all comes back to like this idea of core values, right? So we have core values for our gym. And what we used to do is we used to have these core values for our staff and then core values for our members and try to like blend the two and not use language that was X, Y, or Z, you know, corporate towards our members or not use language that was extremely, you know, unprofessional towards our staff. But what, what I did was I kind of recrafted and, and rethought about the idea of core values, right? Everybody has core values. Integrity. That's everybody's core value. Great. Mm -hmm. Integrity is awesome. You know, I have a giant integrity tattoo across my forearm, like all those things. Integrity is awesome. But I think what you have to have for me is core values that permeate through the entire culture of the business. That's staff. That's the look of the business. That's the feel of the business, the energy of the room, all of those different things. So, you know, you, you talk about not being a money guy first. One of our core values is what we call the hard hat principle, right? And the hard hat principle just says clock in. You don't always feel like it. You're not always going to want to do it. Right. Yeah. We'll just clock in. Consistency beats intensity, right? When intensity is not consistent. So if we can clock in every day and show up for people the way that I believe you should, like you said, going to games. Like I went yesterday, I went to the state championship game. We had, uh, we have, we had four, five guys, five guys who played in yesterday's state championship game for St. Augustine Prep. We had another guy who didn't get in. So we had six guys on that team, right? Unfortunately, they didn't pull it out two years in a row, by the way. St. Augustine oh. Prep dropped the ball in the state championship. It was, and you know what? Yesterday was a hard-fought game with great senior leadership. One of their senior captains, Ryan, is the shortstop. He's been training with me since he was 12 years old. And to see the culmination of that yeah, you know, goes to that point, though, is if you could show up for people consistently the way that you think you should, and that's going to look different for everybody. For me, 
It's being there in those moments. It, it's going to games. It's being at graduation parties. This is graduation party season. You know, I got right after the golf outing on Friday, I got to go straight to a graduation party. You know, it's all those different things. Yeah. And if you could consistently show up and put your hard hat on, even if it doesn't feel like work and from an outside perspective, oh, you know, going to a game, that's not work. Well, I'll tell you, I drove an hour yesterday <laughs> to go to a game. I'm going to drive an hour and 15 each way to go to a game tonight for five eighth graders. You know, is it, it starts to add up a little bit, but if you can consistently well, up, consistently put your hard hat on, you know, good things will happen. Well, and something you just said there too for five eighth graders. Yep. So they're not your top level guys. They're no. not your guys that are going D one in baseball next year. They're so <laughs> it it just hits different when you're going to see an eighth graders game, right? Yeah, it's different for the fan with the parents, the eighth grader. It just it hits different when there it's it's the. It's not your pro athlete. It's not your top level guy. And and I think that that's amazing that you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So tonight is, you know, again, as we're recording this, it'll get released later. But tonight is the PBR. So that's Prep Baseball Report Futures game. So essentially they pick the top eighth graders. And I think it's only like the first or second year they're doing this, the eighth grade version. Yeah. And you try out, you get invited to the tryout, you try out, and then they pick two teams and they play against each other. So to your point, they're not my top level guys, but this is the first time that they've ever been recognized on that kind of, maybe not national, but maybe regional scale, right? So if you want to talk about one of our other core values is called hashtag A-team, right? And the, the kind of the shadow question to the hashtag A-team core value is, is this a gym or is this a family? And one of the big things I always say is I say, listen, we're a family that masquerades as a gym. You know, we're pretending to be a gym. But if your cousin got recognized on the regional scale for the first time as an eighth grader, you would be there. But so many of us as fitness professionals, as clinicians, as practitioners, we don't think it's a big deal or, or which I'm guilty of as well. And I'm sure, you know, everyone listening who's worked at a, with a high level athlete or a few high level athletes, you kind of get null to it, right? You, you get, you get kind of like, it's like a dimmer almost to it. Yeah, they're in eighth grade. You know, plenty of opportunities. I'll go see a game. Before, I'll go see a game next time. But I try to really stay on top of that. Is that big moment for them? This is the only time they'll get it. How can I best help them live that moment to the fullest? And how, if if it's me being there, how can I get there? Yeah. You know. So again, first time on a regional scale, I'll be there. And I treat you know Alex and and Guy and all those guys that are going to play tonight the same way I would show up for. Tevin Farmer in Dubai. I, that that to me is is the same. Yeah, yeah. I think it's great, and and, and I think so. I mean, I uh, every year I say I'm going to make it out to something, and I never do because I get busy. I just yeah. don't make it a priority, and that's a shift that I have to make. But I I applaud you for that because you're as busy as anyone. Priorities are are the key, and and it helps too because. You know, I've, I've built a business where my staff is plus, right? So we only we only hire through our internship process. Our internship process is 16 weeks. And then if we're going to hire you, you go through a 12-week apprenticeship before you run a session on your own. So at no point are we throwing someone who hasn't gone through our system out onto the floor and letting them coach people. So I have a lot of confidence in saying, hey, I'm not going to be in the gym today. I'm going to do a podcast with Dr. John. And then I'm going to head on to uh, Flemington, New Jersey to watch some of our guys play. And because I've built that in and because I've built that system and my, my staff knows, my team knows on their off days, I had an intern last night who's been with us for maybe three weeks, drive up on his own, his own dime to Hamilton, New Jersey and watch the state championship game. He's worked with those athletes once, maybe each at best, you know, and, and when I say worked with them, he's brand new to our internship. He's really just starting to now run the warm up of a few sessions so he hasn't even really worked with them. But again, when you permeate those core values through your entire culture, through the energy, through your staff, through your members, it catches on relatively quickly or it doesn't, which is okay too. And it's just, you know, there's probably a better fit. Yeah. yeah, but I think that speaks to the culture in your gym. You have guys that have been with you forever that have your logo tattooed on them. Yeah, we have 13 ATS logos tattooed. How do you pull that off? I don't know any other business that logo is on 13 of their employees or athletes or whatever. I I have to say this for the record. I've never asked anyone to get an ATS tattoo. <laughs> I think there's probably, there's probably some legality there. Yeah. I've, I've never asked anyone to get it. But again, you know, 
right, they talk about Starbucks, right, and being the third place. Right? As I'm drinking kind of the Starbucks here, they talk about yeah. Starbucks being the third place, right? <laughs> oh, you're home away from home. You know, you have home, you have work, and then you have a third place. I like our gym to be that third place. I aspire for our gym to be that third place. I love when athletes come in and I'm like, oh, you're not signed up to train. And they're like, no, I'm not training. Just kind of hanging out today. Well, tell yeah. me about that too, because I, I haven't been up to the gym in a couple of years and I need to make it, I need to make it a visit, but yeah, please do. I've seen that you, you've also created this recovery lounge. You have, you have a spot for these guys to come hang out. Tell me a little bit about some of those offerings and how that integrates into your training process with whether it's an adult member or some of the, the athletes that you're working with. Yeah. So the recovery studio is pretty awesome. What we did was we needed a place for guys to be able to access modalities, number one, which there's value in modalities, right? And, and we could get into the nitty gritty about how valuable they are and time and, and use and stuff like that. And ultimately, you know, middle of the off season, I don't want my guys, you know, on Normatex, on Mark Pros every day. And again, I guide that process for them. So what we did was we went out, we got pneumatic compression via Normatec. We have legs, arms, hips, we got the whole nine. We have heat and vibration therapy through Hyperice. We have electric stim therapy through Mark Pro, and we have an infrared sauna. So all of those modalities were kind of thrown into this area, into this lounge area. We laid a new floor, we built a new space. We made it really, really nice somewhere where you could spend a lot of time and hang out. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, guys. And everybody's like, oh man, it must be expensive. It must be expensive to go in there. It's a $25 add-on to your gym membership. <laughs> so, yeah. so we're essentially giving those modalities away, you know, and I'm sure there's, again, there's a hyper ice lounge listening to this punch in a wall, you know, ah, yeah, that's our, that's our service. That's our core service. Yep. That's great. And for us, you can't be a member of the recovery studio without being a member of the gym. So it's not like we're going to, you know, steal members or anything from a hyper ice lounge or something like that. But mm -hmm. ultimately for us, it, it goes back to that same thing of creating an optimal training environment and creating a family atmosphere. We have guys that will come to our gym and get there for the three o'clock session at six 30, they'll be playing ping pong. You're like, how, how did this, like, how are you still here, man? You know, it's, yeah. it's an hour here, an hour in the recovery. We have a fridge, we have a kitchen, they eat. All of a sudden now they're playing ping pong. We have the most competitive small ping pong table in the Northeast. And that's a fact. We have this like mini micro table, plays fast. If anybody's any good at ping pong, come on through. Ha happy to take on all challengers. We got some really good guys in there. But yeah, so that, that's our recovery studio. We have that, we have three buildings now too. So I think the last time you were at our place, John, we might've only been the one unit. So we went yeah. from 550 square foot, I was telling the story earlier, in our first sublet to 2,100 square foot. And then in 2017, we went to 5,000 square feet. And then in 2019, we went to oh, just short of 8,000. So, and those two, the last two iterations were the same building. We just kind of took, went from two to the third. Right. That's amazing. That's, it's, I love it. I love it. So how are you getting by into some of these younger guys, you know, because you have this wealth of knowledge and I do want to talk about kind of your education coming up because you... Yeah. If I remember correctly, you kind of took an alternative route, but I, I feel like it's the route that if a, a new up and coming fitness professional that wants to be in your position, I feel like this is the better route to take is the route that you took, even though it was a little bit non-traditional. So yep. maybe we can speak to that, to the up and coming fitness pro that might be listening. Because of that, you have this wealth of knowledge that, but I, but in the past, I found it hard to get a buy-in for recovery in the middle school, high school, even the college age kid. Right. Yep. So how are you getting them buy in to get into some of these recovery services to make sure that they're prepared to train the next day or play in a game, you know, the same night that they trained? Yeah. So it's interesting. It's number one, it's all about touch points. Right. So I, I don't most learners don't learn from one touch point. Right. So if you've ever taught a class or or taken anyone through anything, right, like, you know, whether it's fitness or unrelated, if it's academia, same thing. You know, when I teach a course at Rowan, I teach exercise physiology, I always tell my students, I say, I'm going to touch this same exact fact, the same exact topic. I'm going to touch it three times from three different angles, right? Mm -hmm. So I take that same approach to how we educate our members, right? We're going to create some video content around what we want them to learn. We're going to put it in text. We're going to put a, an infographic together and we're going to send it just to them. And then I'm going to make sure those touch points are in person, 
then via social media, then via their private membership group. Again, so now we have three different touch points. And then all it takes, once you've had those touch points and you've kind of been educated on whichever topic it is, now it's you just need one starter, right? You just need one guy. So when my professional athletes are in the gym, they see my eighth graders, my ninth graders see these professional athletes utilizing our recovery services, utilizing even, even the smaller things like the parts of our warm up that we really believe in, right? Soft tissue work, static work. They see those professional athletes because they train right next to them, right? They see them doing these things and all of a sudden now they know why and they know who else does it and they're immediately bought in. So that's for me, it, it's all about touch points and it's all about delivering that message you know, three different ways, three to six different times. And that's ultimately what I've found is creating the best buy-in. So that, so that's that. But on the academic route, you know, I opened my business at 19. So my brick and mortar was opened at 19. I hadn't even graduated with my bachelor's degree yet. So yeah, I took a very non-traditional route to kind of getting started. I went to every seminar whether I believed in the methodology or completely was contrarian to the methodology. Because when you view contrarian viewpoints, it, it either deepens your understanding of your own and or challenges your own, or you change your mind, right? Mm -hmm. so I went to everything I could go to. I was going to North Jersey, South Carolina, went all the way out to Western PA, you know, anywhere I could go. I was driving, I was sleeping in my car, I had no money. I had one credit card. I think it had like a $3,000 limit. And some of the seminars, as you know, they could be, you know, 1300 1500 plus I got to get there. So I would, I would run the card, drive out, sleep in my car, take a book full of notes, talk to whoever I could, try to pick their brains. And then I'd get back in my car and drive back. And the next weekend I would do it again. And I did that from 19 to 21, 22. Every single weekend there was something, I was there. There was no way you could go to a seminar, I guess that was 2011, 12, 13. There was no way you went to a seminar on the East Coast in, in those years and didn't see me. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So much so that I now meet guys and I go, yeah, I remember you from X, Y, or Z. And they're like, yeah. you were there? And I'm like, yeah, I was the kid in the back writing feverishly, trying to get everything that everyone was saying down into my notebook and not bothering anyone. That was me. After that, though... I started guest lecturing at Rowan and one of my mentors at Rowan said to me, he said, you know, you'd be a great professor. And I said, well, what's that mean? How do I do that? And he's like, you got to go back to school. So I went back to school, killed my master's degree. I did it in, a, I did my entire master's. I graduated from Liberty University. I did it all in eight months. So I, that's, there was points where I was taking, you know, 16 master's credits at once, plus running the gym and doing different things. And then I went back to school again for massage therapy, started last year. Yeah. So, so that's kind of my academic route, but, and I still go to seminars now. Now I don't go nearly as much. I try to do something every quarter. Yeah. Uh, and I try to, on top of that, I try to do an online course and a book every month. That's kind of been my goal. So an online course, a book every month, something live in person every quarter. Last quarter, I went to Pittsburgh for CVASPs. Mm -hmm. We're going to see VASPs again. That's in Richmond in July. So, and those, and the bigger ones, we take our whole staff. We take our whole staff twice a year to something. Yeah, I think, and that's great. That I don't, it's, it's hard to keep that motivation up. Like I remember being exactly like you, a seminar a weekend. And yep. since then, I, you know, family, other stuff's gotten involved and it's kind of tailed off. So I admire you for keeping that motivation and then absolutely making it a part of the staff and the culture of the gym to make sure your staff stays educated and motivated. And it would be hard with the energy you bring to, for me to believe that any of your staff becomes unmotivated because you would absolutely hold them accountable if they did. Yeah. You know, what's interesting too, to that point, if it's not a part of your culture, right, it, it's going to be really hard to get it going, but you have to roll that ball. And everyone always says from business ownership, you know, and I'm sure everyone's heard this a thousand times. What if I pay to educate my staff and they leave? It's like, well, it would be a lot worse if they stayed and they stayed uneducated, right? So you have to be willing to grow. And I think one of the things that we do as fitness professionals and business owners is we romanticize the process. We romanticize our brand, our business. You know, it, it's this thing. It's so, you know, romantic to us and so close and deeply rooted and personal to us. But to an outsider, to one of your staff, it may not be that. 
right? It may not be that romantic of an experience. You know, some of my staff didn't even know who I was when I opened the gym and I had to save every dollar I had to buy my first rack off of Amazon. Mm -hmm. Shout out to that rack. That rack lasted a long time, right? But they weren't there for that piece. They see now where I'm like, you know what? We need a belt squat. Let's order one. You know, it's, it's a very different thing. And that's okay. And I think having some transparent dialogue with your staff around that and saying like, hey, you know, what's your ultimate goal? I have a guy on my staff right now on, who I know wants to own his own gym. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Really excited. And what I'm trying to do is put him in positions to not only network with people who own their own gyms besides me so he can pick their brains, but also give him step up challenges to gym ownership. Okay, cool. Do some liaison work. Follow up with some leads. Do some assessments. Do some, you know, for lack of a better term, sales calls, some sales, you know, consultations. Do all of those things. So when you do leave and you do open your own place, you'll be ready. I'd much rather someone leave my place happy and go do their own thing, even if they want to compete with us, than to leave my place on bad terms and not be prepared for the next step in their careers. Because that doesn't reflect well on me either. And that's yeah. part of the growth process of, of, you know, kind of de-romanticizing the business. Yeah. And I share that mindset with you too. It, it's a growth mindset. It's there's enough people to go around. And if you can help educate. So what if you're giving someone, you know, money and they uh, you know to, to further education and they leave, like it only helps to, if you do do it the right way and you're teaching them how to run a gym, you're teaching them all your systems, you're teaching them how to best treat individuals. So what if they leave? Because then your coaching tree grows. And you exactly. have to show everybody that you're doing it right. And they'll always be thankful to you for preparing them to have a successful gym in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. One, one of my mentors, actually, he, he ran a gym in like the D.C., Virginia area. And he said it best. He said, if you're here, you know, more than two years, that's what he used to tell his staff. If you're here more than two years, you're doing something wrong. And so am I. You know, yeah. we've made a mistake. But and now necessarily... I don't exactly approach it like that because some of our guys will be with us longer than two years. You know, one of my, our, our director of fitness has been with me over seven years, right? But it, again, it just goes back to that transparent conversation. Like, what are you trying to get out of this and how can I best help you get it? And being real, like, you know, if somebody else came to me today and with the staff I already have and they said, hey, I need a full-time job tomorrow, I would tell them, like, we don't have that available for you. Like, and it's probably not going to be for a few years. So do you want to invest in that? Now, granted, with the internship program, a lot of my interns come in, they just want to become really great practitioners of strength conditioning, really great practitioners of fitness training. Those guys I can help immediately, right? We already have that, right? We, we don't, it's not going to cost us anything to do that and to help you grow there. But again, transparent conversation and, and being, again, de-romanticized with the gym. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's the hard part a little bit. I would love, it's almost like I would love to keep staff for 20, 30 years, pay them appropriately so they're all making a great living that they can support themselves, which is, you know, everybody knows strength and conditioning, the salaries tend to run a little bit low. But if we can create an environment where people are making a livable salary or preparing them to leave, I think it, it's a win-win for everyone, right? So absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. Well, that's great. You- Love it. You know, what, what we have to do is, now this is like a bigger kind of picture thing, but what we have to do is ultimately, am I still here? Yeah. What we have to do is ultimately, sorry, I'm grabbing my charger, John. You're all good. Ultimately is create a bigger barrier of entry. If we want to be paid better as a strength conditioning, as a profession, then ultimately we have to create a, a, a greater barrier for entry, right? And right now there is no barrier for entry, which I always say is good and bad, you know? Mm-hmm. If there was a barrier for entry, I wouldn't have opened my gym at 19. There would have been no way I could have done it. And some of the best coaches I know in the world have no certification, no degree, nothing. Right. On the flip side of that, for every one of those great coaches, there's 25, 30 people who are unfortunately playing with the bio, the, 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 the biomotor systems of individuals every day with a lack of understanding of, of just how far they could really change someone in a negative way, especially from an athletic perspective, right? The athletic window is so small, yeah. especially at the highest level, you know, to, to negatively impact an athlete's career is to negatively impact their quality of life is to negatively impact, you know, their story, so to speak, their legacy that they'll pass on through their family. So I'm always torn on that. Like I want something in place, but also maybe not. 
Yeah, but you know what? You, you're controlling what you can control. You've created this 16 week internship process, which I know is of the utmost quality because of just the way that you are. Yeah. And then even if you're hiring someone from that, it's another 12 weeks. It's not yep. like they're going straight into being a coach on the floor by themselves, right? Yeah, 100%. So, you, so you're controlling what you can control. And the way that I've started to look at things a little bit is controlling what you can, can control in your circle of influence. When you start reaching and trying to get these things across the country, or across the world to educate, sometimes it falls apart. And I think if you organically let it grow to that, like, you know, maybe the next step is you're bringing your internship program online somehow. I, I don't know, but yeah, it's, if you can, you're, you know, as you're now that you're 11 years into business, I'm sure your coaching tree has grown where you've influenced all these different people who are now influencing the next generation coming up. And then very quickly, you've been, and especially with your teaching at rowing, you've influenced a thousand people yep. that are now influencing another two or three each or, you know, and it just quickly grows. And that's how you change the world by creating the small little ripples that turn into big waves. I love that. No, I love yeah. that. And and for me, the next step has been the consulting piece, right? So about six years ago, I started doing consulting at the division one level for division one baseball teams. Mm -hmm. So where, you know, they would fly me out, I would educate essentially the staff on how to most appropriately train and treat their athletes. And now that has grown to having private sector gyms bring me in to educate their staff on how to train. And it's mostly baseball guys. You know, that's what I, that's what I'm known for. You know, how do we work with these baseball guys? I was just in Michigan last, oh, I guess that was a few months ago. Man, I'm getting old. Time goes fast. Probably seven or eight months ago, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, educating 16 coaches on how to train baseball players. And you get into that nitty gritty. And like you said, maybe that is the next step is to try to expand that as, as best you can. And while you're there, you know, lay that foundation, lay those seeds, start that ripple. As, as you adequately put it, I love that. Start that ripple, you know, so maybe now guys are starting to dive a little bit deeper, you know, how can we really make the impact we want to make? How can we really change the the athlete in front of us as both a person and as a, as a performer? So right. I, I hope that's how it works. Well, and, and you just, I love how you just put person first. Like, you seem to just be it. You want quality people in the gym. You want to be a quality. You want to be a positive influence on these kids showing up to an eighth graders game, showing them the example of what a man should be. Yeah. Right. And then from there, the training comes into play and you're creating these well-rounded individuals that when they eventually leave your gym to go on to college or, you know, they're gone for nine months of the year in a professional setting, like you've just created these quality, you've helped to create these quality individuals that, are out there changing the world the way that they're going to change the world. And that's the stuff that chokes me up, right? So yesterday I told you I was at the state championship game. One of my athletes, I won't put him out like that, but he texted me and he said, you know, thank you for everything you've done. I'm ready to lead as both a person and as a player. And he actually said lead from the front, which is one of our core values, funny enough. I'm ready to lead from the front as a person as a, and as a player because of you. And it's like, man, like that's the stuff. And I'm super emotional. I look tough and stuff. I got the tattoos and all that. That was just to cover up my emotional side, <laughs> right? So like, this is the stuff that it's hard for me to talk about because of that. But that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Those texts mean the world to me. You know, those messages, those notes, we have a board at my gym, my office of handwritten notes mm -hmm. that people have written to myself, my staff. And those notes always tell the story, right? You changed me. Very few people say, you know, thank you so much for helping me throw 90. Cool. We do that all the time, right? That is, that is a, a really, you know, just a, a, an understanding of what are the biodynamics of sport? What are the biomo biomotor qualities that will ultimately raise this person's ceiling and also protect their foundation, right? And that's what I talk about when I do my consulting is that as strength coaches, we impact the basement, the foundation, we try to keep guys healthy, right? Because if you're not healthy, you can't perform your sport. And then we try to impact the ceiling, which is essentially, you know, how high can I push these biodynamic demands as it relate to competition exercise, competition activity. But the other stuff, the stuff in between is really the stuff that makes the biggest difference. And ultimately for me, what I'm trying to impact, I'm really good and, I'm, and, and I won't pull any punches. I'm really good at strength and conditioning. That's, that's what I do. Right. But... I'm much better at coaching, which are two completely separate things to me.
Yeah, and I, and I think that's where young professionals will get lost in the weeds. They're trying to create the perfect program without real, realizing it's really how you connect with your people. And like you said at the very beginning is the coaching aspect of it, the connections of it, the relationship building. That's really where it's at, right? And yeah. then the strength and conditioning principles will come. Yeah, people come to your gym, come to your service for results, but they stay for the experience and the relationship. But no one stays because the training's awesome. You know, like if you think about it, right? Your training could be awesome. And they're still, if they don't get the experience that they want and the relationship's not built and, and really managed appropriately, they're still going to look side to side for what other people are doing. You know, man, that could be more enjoyable for me. That could be something that could be more life changing for me. So, again, people come for results. Sure helps if you get them. You know, if you're not good at that, then go out and read Verkashansky. Like, you know, yeah. it's available it's, on Amazon. It's, it's just so special that you had a high school senior text you that. How many high school seniors are being that introspective and really, you know, thinking about it that way and then sending that text to, to you know, have a relationship that they're they're comfortable enough to send a text like that? Yeah, and that, and that comes to, uh, again, back to what coaching is, right? Coaching is taking people from where they are to where they want to go. And it's it needs to be managed appropriately right mm -hmm. when someone says i want to go from x to y or a to b there's a lot of steps on that road you know people talk about linear progress and these different setbacks and all those things but i think the other thing you have to uh, optimize is that that coactive model of psychological and physical right like these things are incorporated one in the other and by the way if you want to get really good physical change with your athletes there's a psychological piece to that as well, right? They're, you know, the Venn diagram, they intersect at points. If your athletes aren't psychologically bought into your program or don't psychologically trust you on the back end, if they don't feel that they have a relationship with you, they won't follow through the same way. And intent is, is a driver of ultimately the impact that you have, right? If they don't put the same intent into it, the impact physically and psychologically is not going to be the same. So, it would behoove coaches to, to look at coaching models and relationship models as, as important, if not more important, than physical, physiological models. Yeah, absolutely. I'm on a little bit of a soapbox, and I don't mean to be there, but, you know, in 10 years, what I've learned is some of the stuff we did in year one of our business, we still do. Again, I'm a training nerd, so I'm really trying to make sure I don't lie. We still do 10 years in, mm -hmm. but the way I talk to people, the way I communicate with people is not even close to the same, Yeah, right? And that's what's really grown. And it's always funny, like we have students coming in shadow and I'll, I'll tell them what session, yeah, come in at X, Y, or Z time. You know, I'm training three pro athletes at that time and they'll see the workout and they'll go, that's it. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> you know, you thought it was going to be like fireworks, you know? Yeah, they came in. They did soft tissue work. They stretched. Maybe I stretched them. You know, mm -hmm. they did some power work. <laughs> they did some some pointed strength training. And then they recovered. It's, it's kind well, of it. Well, well, that's the thing. And, and then we were just we early on we talked about the social media following that you've grown to. But and you know, with the the new up and coming culture of social media and looking for the the next best, greatest exercise or whatever, what it really comes down to is consistency and basics. Right? Yeah, it's consistency and basics. And then, you know, we, we had talked off camera about being able to redefine the basics, right? And that's, and that's what really, that's what coaching is. That's the value in coaching from a physiological model is that, mm -hmm. you know, once you understand the exercises, what they're supposed to look like and all those different things, now you have to start to think about the individual in front of you, what their adaptation goal is, and then tailor everything you do to that adaptation, right? I talked to you again off camera, and I made a post about this, and I, you know, a bunch of 13-year-olds argued with me like they always do. I, I might have the same exercise and have three athletes, very high-level athletes at that, do the exact same exercise, and I might coach it three completely different ways. Right. So it's in the system, you know, it's, in the, it's on your sheet as med ball shot put. Yeah. But the way I'm teaching it is completely separate, right? I might have a professional boxer do a med ball shot put. I might coach it one way for him, and then I might have a professional pitcher coming in the next hour. I'm going to coach that med ball shot put completely separate, right? Because I understand 
biodynamics essentially and mm -hmm. the individual in front of me and what they're trying to accomplish from that med ball shot put right it starts to become less about what the pieces are but more about how they fit yeah absolutely and that's the nuance in coaching right yep. and that's the thing i think people sometimes you know, how long did it take you to train a professional athlete? These kids that you're teaching in undergrad right now, they want to jump right into that where yep. you just need to get reps under your belt. Like you should be, if you're get, if you're going through exercise science classes at Rowan right now, you should already be training individuals, like getting in yeah. the gym, trying to write programs for your friends, get understanding the nuance of how to coach exercises differently for one individual versus another, because people are going to respond to different cues for a hip hinge, you know, depending on their body type, et cetera. But I think for the young up and coming professional, a lot of times my advice is just coach. hundred percent. get reps. And it's always, it's always the inverse relationship too, right? The coaches who are already pretty good, right? As undergrads and probably should accept money for their, for their expertise are always scared. They always tell me I'm not ready to take money. Yeah. So therefore I don't do anything. And the, and the inverse seems to always be true, too. The coaches that are a little bit rougher around the edges probably need a lot more time in the trenches, are always ready to take money. They're like, oh, I need to get paid for what I'm doing. It's like there's an inverse there, which is kind of interesting, and just in my experience. And, again, if you're accepting dollars for services right now and I'm, and I'm upsetting you, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually not sorry, but I am sorry, I guess, you know, all those things. But if if you want to be really good at coaching it takes that it takes those those hours those, that time in the trenches i have some students right now that i just say hey listen find a family member who wants to do something whether it's lose weight get better at sport whatever whatever say hey i'm going to train you for free but i have to document the entire process that documentation will do two things number one it'll create content for you right which then you can use to market your future services and or two, it will show you just how bad or good you are, right? The quality of movement that's that's shown in that documentation, the adaptation or lack thereof that's shown in that documentation throughout whatever you think, you know, your key performance indicators are, mm -hmm. will tell you, hey, man, what I'm doing is not working or what you're doing is working, you know, and then you can, again, build on that self-esteem and or go learn more. And, and that brings it full circle into making sure you step out of your comfort zone taking on things that scare you head on yes. and learning and growing from those opportunities um, to become who CJ Appenzeller is today. Yeah, it's all full circle. You know, when I started out, I was lucky enough that in my very first year of coaching, I started coaching, you know, a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. That was completely on accident though. And I had no intention of setting out to coach, you know, pro athletes. I never truthfully at 19, I never thought about it that way. I always figured, and, and maybe this is, you know, maybe I wasn't that intelligent. I don't know. But I always figured those guys that were with me on day one, I figured they would be pro. I'm like, no, like, I truly believe in, in what we're doing. And I believe in my guys right here in front of me. And I'm like, well, they'll be pros. And I'll just, I'll just keep training them. And that speaks to, to the longevity, to the relationships, to all those things. We have athletes right now. I have one professional athlete right now who trained with me the first day. That day I told you when I showed up for that interview, mm -hmm. he was there for that training session. And he's trained with me ever since. Yeah. 11 years. <laughs> and he's a professional athlete. And it's like, well, he's seen some things happen, right? He's seen some growth in the business and things like that. But that's what I always believed. I'm like, yeah, well, these guys right here will be pros. So I won't have to go out and get any pros because my guys will be pros. And we have some of that. We have pros right now in the Nationals organization. Been with me six years. I have pros in the Royals organization who have been with me since they were in high school. I have pros. I mean, one of our guys right now is pitching for the New York Yankees, which is awesome, right? He's been with me for three years. All of our guys, when I start, you know, when people come in and they ask for that kind of resume, so to speak, it's always interesting because a lot of my guys have been training with me for three, six, nine years mm -hmm. and seen that development over that period of time. And I, and I don't know that everyone else is like that. I also don't know what anyone else is doing on a strength conditioning right. standpoint, but I don't think that everyone else is that way you know yeah maybe some people have one of those stories or two of those stories and you know i got this kid right before he hit puberty and now he's a pro we have you know we have jerseys on our wall in our gym and you know boxing trunks jerseys all these things from our pro athletes and each one tells a story yeah each of those stories is is a different length 
and each of those stories is is different in terms of context but each of them makes me really really proud of that athlete because i didn't have him for one day one session one workout one you know film shoot whatever i i remember that moment and i remember all the little steps all those micro steps and the setbacks and the micro steps that it took for him to put that on which was his only goal or her only goal you know so again emotional stuff but but something that's really important to me and, and something that i you know if you were like you know talk to us about what it is that makes you like why should we train with you i think it's that i think it's that i built relationships with guys and gals who these relationships span over literally a decade yeah. you know and i think that's a testament to my coaching ability more so than anything else more so than any six week program or six week result log or anything else yeah. i think that's the testament to, to what i do and what my facility does is we build relationships we foster we foster those relationships and we're really really good at physiological stuff but even more so on coaching the person in front of us i love it that's that's the family first atmosphere and and that's where it comes back to money's never been your driver and i think that's why you're succeeding and doing so well i appreciate I, you yeah absolutely I, so on that note, this comes up to our, I think that's a good kind of segue to, to work toward closing the, the podcast here. But we always end these with the final five quick fire questions that uh -oh. you're not prepared for, just to give people a deeper insight into the sensitive person that you are, CJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're going to make, you might make me cry in the final five. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. But what's your walkout song? Oh, actually, I know exactly what this is. It's called, it's by Yellow Wolf. It's called You and Me. All right. I'm a big Yellow Wolf fan. Nobody even really knows who that is, which is interesting. Now we'll look that up and we'll, we'll like, maybe we'll link it into the podcast. Yeah, the please do. Song. Yeah. What's your favorite exercise? I don't have favorite exercises. I have favorite adaptations. Okay. <laughs> what about, so you have a powerlifting background, right? I do. And I don't even, didn't. I do none of those exercises anymore. All right. Do you still nope. compete? You're, so you're not competing at all anymore? No, nope, not competing in powerlifting. No, I've been uh, boxing for coming up on a year now. So I kind of get the competition juices going there. I spar at the boxing gym. I do it all. Got it. Nice. One food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, man. Oysters, which is weird because that would be a weird breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they're so amazing. And then do you have a guilty pleasure? Oh, so, too many. Too many. But right now it's been high noon seltzers. Oh, you went down that road? <laughs> yeah. There's been a lot of high noon seltzers lately. That speaks to your sensitive side a little bit there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And what's your favorite thing about the Philadelphia area, finally? Oh, man. My favorite thing is going to a Phillies game, but I'm excited. I have a guy in double-A right now who, with the Phillies bullpen, he should be in the bullpen. Shout out to the Phillies organization. I'm not pressuring you guys or anything, but I'm excited for that because I know that day is coming soon. Nice. That'll be fun. You got it. You got it. You're going to get to the first game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, CJ, well, can you please share any contact information, social media, if anybody wants to reach out to you, learn more about what you're doing, how can they find out what you're putting out there? Yeah, so happy hour everywhere. So happy hour with no H everywhere you can find me. Instagram and TikTok are really what I do. I have a Twitter. I've never tweeted, I don't think. I just kind of sits there. So yeah, Instagram, TikTok, at happy hour. Okay. And then the gym, does the gym have a website? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, I love it. My marketing company is probably pulling their hair out, but yeah, but you know what? You're doing amazing things. I think you're one of the best, you know, strength and conditioning professionals in definitely in the Philadelphia region, but if not the East coast and even the, the country, I think you're doing amazing things. It's showing for it. I can't state that enough, how much I respect what you're doing. And I appreciate all the energy that you bring and the, the changes that you're making in all the kids' lives that you're, you're touching. So thank I you. I appreciate you, doc. All right, CJ, until next time, it has to be longer. You know, we have to make sure we touch base, you know, more often. Yeah, so I'll see you tomorrow, which I'm fired up about, but you're going to be running around like crazy. So let's make sure tomorrow we make some plans to hang out soon. All right, you got it, man. I'll talk to you soon. You got it, Doc. See you soon. Bye-bye. Right.